Hello everyone, this talk is about model understanding with Captum and PyTorch. I'd like to start the talk by briefly motivating model interpretability and introducing a novel interpretability library for PyTorch. I'll give a brief overview of the algorithms that we currently support in the library and also show how you can distribute the computations across multiple GPUs. Then I'll talk about how to debug more complex models and visualize attributions. Lastly, I'll briefly go over the limitations and challenges of attribution methods and future directions. The definition of model interpretability is rather elusive, and many of you probably have heard about various different definitions of it. But in order to bring more clarity, let's define it as the ability to describe AI model internals and their predictions in human understandable terms. You might ask why is model interpretability important? It is important because it helps us to better understand our model's predictions and understand how our models reason. Most importantly, it facilitates with debugging misclassified predictions. And uh, lastly, the better we understand our models, the more likely it is that we'll improve them. And thereof, the mo more likely it is that we'll push the boundaries of cutting each research. So how can we make interpretability algorithms available for high performing models and accessible to all PyTorch model developers? To do so, we developed a model interpretability library called Captum. Captum means comprehension in Latin, and the library has three main focus areas. The first area, uh, focus area is that it is multimodal, meaning that the library can be used for any type of models and features. Secondly, it is extensible, meaning that you can extend it, add new features and algorithms. And thirdly, it is easy to use. This means that you can use it with a couple lines of code. Our current uh, version, 0 0.2.0, contains a number of well-tested gradient and perturbation-based attribution algorithms. Those algorithms allow us to interpret output predictions with respect to the inputs, the output predictions with respect to all neurons in the layers, and the neurons with respect to the inputs. We plan to expand the library and add more algorithms beyond attribution-based approaches. The following diagram summarizes all attribution algorithms that we currently have in Captum library, divided into two groups. The first group on the left side of the diagram features the algorithms that attribute the output predictions or internal neurons to the inputs of the model. The second group on the right side features the algorithms that allow to attribute the outputs of the network to the internal layer. Some of the algorithms in the, on the right side uh, represent slight variations of the ones on the left side. Besides that, it, we can see that the algorithms are highlighted using different colors. The gradient-based attribution approaches are highlighted in orange, the perturbation-based uh, attribution approaches are highlighted in green, and the third group that is neither um, gradient nor perturbation-based approaches are highlighted in blue. Within these algorithms, you'll recognize a number of them that are well-known simple baseline approaches, such as well-known silency maps and layer activations. There are also a number of algorithms that are well-known from computer vision community. Although in the literature, these approaches are um, well-known and used for computer vision models, our implementation our implementations are generic and they can be used for any model that meets the criteria uh, for the model uh, to be used with that specific attribution um, algorithm. For example, um, if, for example, if the models are from the CNN families, then they can be used um, uh, with uh, GradCam and guided GradCam. Most algorithms require also so-called baseline, uh, which is uh, also known as reference or background in the literature. 
Baseline is an important concept in the world of attribution, attributions and I will spend a couple minutes talking about it. Oftentimes when we want to understand what properties characterize the best certain object, we compare it with other objects and seek for differences and contrast. Baseline or reference is based on that concept. It helps, helps us to blame particular parts of our inputs for a prediction based on the comparison with the reference or baseline. In case of an image and this particular example, if we want to attribute to the dog class, it is obvious to compare it with an image where there is no dog. Oftentimes people will ablate the dog and replace it with a rectangle and observe uh, prediction drops for dog class. But one might think that uh, this can create a baseline sample that, out of, uh, that is out of training and test data distributions. A more natural way of ablating the dog uh, could be to replace it with a background, um, like in this example. Similar concept applies to text. We can compare the text with a sequence of uninformative tokens or replace one of the tokens with a random token or a padding token. In a general case, when we have a numerical representation of any input, we can think of setting some of those features to constant values, such as zeros, or permuting them, or performing other operations on them. As we can see, the choice of baseline um, is very challenging because there are many different ways of choosing baseline and there is no ideal way of choosing it. In this part of the presentation, I'd like to walk you through a simple neural network and demonstrate how we can apply model interpretability algorithms from Captum library on it. This network takes an input of three features followed by a linear layer, ReLU, and an output of two targets. Let's say we would like to attribute one of our targets, namely target zero, to the inputs of our, feature, uh, of our network, namely input features. To do so, we choose an attribution algorithm, in this case integrated gradients, and import it from captum.attr package. Integrated gradients is similar to omen shapley method from cooperative game theory for infinite games and non-atomic measures, where each feature isn't a single point in a feature space, but it is an infinitesimal subset of it. This approach has many interesting properties and I'll talk about one of those properties in my next slides. As next, we create an instance of integrated gradient using the forward function of our model and define our input. In this case, the input is a random uh, tensor. To perform attributions, we call attribute on the attribution algorithm by providing our inputs and the target index that we would like to attribute to. Um, and also, um, we can provide baseline, but in this case, I chose to use default baseline, which is zero baseline. Integrated gradients performs forward and backward passes and computes the path integral of our gradients from baseline to input. The return to attributions have the same shape and dimensionality as the inputs. The magnitude of attribution score signifies the strength of the important signal, which in this case is color coded in green and red. Green means that those particular features uh, contribute uh, in predicting the target zero. Red means that those particular features are um, negatively correlated with target zero. Um, we can also return integral approximation um, error, uh, which is uh, which we can um, compute it using return convergence delta argument. Uh, the delta is computed based on one of the properties of integrated gradients. Um, and that property is called a completeness property, which states that the sum of the attribution is equal to the differences of our function at its input and baseline. 
if our delta is large, in this case uh, it is 0 0.0 on 1, and if we think that it's large, we can reduce um, the delta by increasing the number of integral approximation steps, as I did on this slide. We can also uh, choose to define a baseline. In this case, I decided to use a random baseline instead of zero baseline. And as we can see, when we change the baseline, um, then our attribution also changes. And one of our important feature features now became uh, less important. In general case, we can seamlessly switch from one attribution algorithm to another and compare their performance and different properties. All attribution algorithms have the same signature. We can use PyTorch model data parallels to distribute the computations across multiple GPUs. We can do this uh, also for layer attribution approaches by setting a hook on a layer and aggregating final results in the hook. I will show on this example how we use uh, data parallels for a layer activation method. So a layer activation sets a hook on a particular layer of interest and allows to access the activations of that layer. In this uh, case, uh, since we want to use layer activations with data parallel, we wrap our model with data parallel and also uh, define the GPUs. Uh, uh, the GPUs. Uh, in this case, uh, we use three GPU devices. Let's say that we'd like to look into the layer activations of the first linear layer. Um, in this case, we create an instance of layer activation, pass our model, which is wrapped with data parallel, and also pass our first linear layer. Then we define our inputs. Uh, I chose uh, three input examples, um, and uh, we call attribute on um, our ad uh, layer activation um, algorithm and um, pass our random inputs. When we pass the random inputs under the hood um, data parallel um, splits our three examples on three different GPUs and it distributes those three examples on three different GPUs and computes um, performs the forward passes on each GPU for each example and also uh, activations are available for each example on each separate GPU. So then we can ultimately collect uh, those activations from all the GPUs and return final activations, um, as you can see on this slide. Uh, so for all examples, uh, the first activation is negative and uh, the second activation is positive. Similarly, if an algorithm requires both forward and backward passes, then both of those passes are performed on separate GPUs and their results are ultimately aggregated. Some of the algorithms internally expand the inputs depending on some input parameters, such as number of steps for integrated gradients, conductance, internal influence. To avoid out of memory situations, we perform internal batching using internal batch size parameter. Similar to, uh, similarly, for the perturbation algorithms that require only forward pass and perturbations of all features, we perform perturbations batch-wise for multiple features together, and we do it distributed across multiple GPUs. In one of our experiments, we run uh, integrated gradient using pre-trained VGG19 model that we wrapped with data parallel um, and adjusted internal batch size accordingly. And we use fixed number of approximation steps, which was uh, 2990. And um, as we can see, the execution time is declining as we increase the number of GPUs gradually. Um, in, this, uh, in this example, we also use a pre-trained VGG model and a single image to perform feature ablation using different number of ablations per forward pass. We can see that the execution time decreases as we increase the number of ablations per forward pass, meaning that we ablate 
multiple features together in a batch and distribute it across multiple GPUs. Okay, so until now uh, we were uh, talking about simple toy models and how we could distribute the computations across multiple GPUs. Now let's look into more complex models and see how we can apply CapDoom on those models and visualize attributions. In this example, we use pre-trained ResNet um, 152 model and occlusion algorithm to attribute to the dog class. Red pixels correspond to negative attribution, neg meaning that those pixels um, uh, on the image, um, um, they pull away from the dog class or negatively contribute to the attributed class. White means that those pixels do not contribute to the prediction and green means that those pixels are very important for predicting dog. And as we can see, the uh, green pixels are concentrated on the head of the dog. That means that they are important pixels and um, predicting dog. Now, when we attribute to the cat class, we observe that the pixels corresponding to dog on the image uh, turned red because they pull away from the cat class um, and they are red. And the pixels which are on the cat, they turned green. That means that they pull towards cat class. Those are important pixels for predicting cat. We can also perform feature ablation based on image segmentation. In this example, we segmented the image into three segments, bottles, monitors, and the background. We constructed the feature mask based on those three segments and attributed it to monitor class. In this example, we can see that the background is neutral, bottles pull away from the attributed monitor class, and the pixels on the monitors are uh, very important for predicting the monitor. Uh, it is also interesting to observe that the borders of the monitor that separate one segment from another are also red, meaning that they pull away from monitor class. To make those visualizations more interactive and being able to debug our models, we developed an interactive model debugging and understanding tool called CapDoom Insights. CapDoom Insights supports different types of models and input features. Uh, the visualizations can be also embedded uh, into Jupyter Notebooks or Collab Notebooks. Uh, CapDoom Insights has built-in renderers for some feature types. Uh, image is one of those. We can interpret the predictions of any image and any computer vision model using our API and visualization tool. In this case, we used a pre-trained ResNet 50 model. Um, and the tool also allows to attribute um, the predicted classes to different input pixels. It helps to understand uh, incorrectly predicted samples uh, using its um, interactive functionality. Similarly, we have renders for text. Captum Insights can help us to debug and understand which tokens in text are important for the prediction. This particular example is a model that we trained on IMDb dataset. The magnitude of attribution scores ranges in the color spectrum from blue very important to red least important. The intensity of the colors signifies the strength of the importance signal. For the features that currently do not have any built-in renders, we use bar charts to visualize the attributions. In this case, we visualize the attributions of the features from Titanic dataset for a simple three-layer MLP model. Similar to previous example, we color code the importance of each feature in each predict predicted sample. We can also extend the list of renders and define new ones uh, for any specific type of feature that we choose to. And most importantly, we can also visualize the attributions uh, of multimodal models, in this case, visual question answering. Um, this is especially interesting because we can see where is the important signal coming from or from which modality. And uh, the tool can also help us dig deeper into specific modality um, and see where is the important, uh, important signal coming from. 
On this, in this uh, section of the presentation, I would like to briefly talk about a case study for bird models. We fine-tuned a bird model on squat question answering data set and overall we uh, reached a F1 score of 86 and an exact match of 78. Our goal is to understand the importance of different types of tokens in different layers for our fine-tuned model. There has been already some work done in visualizing and understanding bird models that was mostly around visualizing and understanding the attention matrices, but in this particular Case study would like to uh, use attribution algorithms to understand different layers for our predictions. We choose a simple text that I would like to use for our uh, question answering squad classification model. And that text is, it is important to us to include, empower and support humans of all kinds. And the simple question that we would like to ask about the text and that question is, what is important to us? We want that our model finds the answer to our question in that text. More specifically, that it predicts the start and end tokens of the answer. In order to use the text and the question um, as input to our model, we need to concatenate them together and tokenize them as shown on this slide. Then we load our fine-tuned question answering model, uh, which uh, you can see on the following slide. Uh, on the right side, uh, we have uh, a section of the loaded model. Now let's predict the start and end uh, positions using our model. And we can see that the model is able to correctly predict start and end uh, positions of our answer. Now we're ready to apply some of our attribution algorithms on bird layers and understand which layers are important for our predictions. To do so, we need to set interpretation hooks on all 12 layers and we set a hook per layer. Then we use layer conductance to, to compute attributions for each layer, both for start um, and end position predictions. That allows us to generate heat maps shown on this slide. Each cell on the heat map represent, represents the accumulated importance score of a layer for a given input token for predicting the start position. As uh, we can see, the question token what and the answer token two have high importance score. The answer token became especially important for the last three layers. We can perform some similar exercise for the prediction of end token position. And we can see that here the question token what uh, is still also very important. And the end token kind has a very high uh, importance score, especially uh, in the last two layers. As we can see, we can uh, do many uh, interesting experiments and understand our models using attribution methods. However, attribution methods come also with their limitations. They do not capture feature correlations and interactions. Finding good baselines um, is challenging, as I also showed in, on my previous slides. Uh, attribution methods are very difficult to evaluate and compare with each other, and they do not explain the model globally. In the future, we plan to expand a Captum library beyond attribution approaches and add a Captum robust package, which will focus on adversarial robustness and attacks and studying the intersection between model robustness and interpretability. Captum metric that will focus on um, uh, model sensitivity, trust, infidelity metrics for both the model and attribution. Um, and Captum benchmarks uh, that will provide benchmarking for different data sets um, using different methodologies, including sanity checks, and Captum Optim that um, will focus on optimization algorithms. And one of the first approaches that we would like to add here is the optimization based visualizations. In the second part of the talk, Ludwig will talk about optimization based feature visualizations in PyTorch, which will become part of Captum.optim package.
Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. My name is Ludwig. I work at OpenAI in a team led by Christopher Ola called Clarity that broadly tries to understand the inner working of neural networks. A vital part of our tool chain in that endeavor has been feature visualization. And so in the remainder of this talk, I hope to explain to you what we believe feature visualization is, right? what we mean by the word. I will then try to convince you that it is useful by showing you how we've been using feature visualization in a variety of projects. And finally, I hope to give you a sneak preview of how we plan to implement feature visualization in PyTorch Captain in a way that both works robustly, but also isn't surprising to use from an API point of view, right? It should, it should work like another tool in PyTorch. Now, to help explain what something is, it can sometimes be helpful to contrast it with what it's not. And when you hear about interpretability research and interpretability methods, oftentimes you'll see attribution methods, right? Methods that for a specific example, try to explain what parts of that example caused the network to behave in a particular way. Feature visualization, on the other hand, is slightly different in that it's trying to answer questions about network behavior, right? Like what specific parts of a network are, are looking for, what they're detecting by generating examples, synthetic examples through optimization, right? In the simplest case, that might be a question as simple as like, what is a specific neuron looking for? But they can be more complicated questions. And I'll show you some when we're going over some of our work. So fundamentally, Feature visualization is an optimization process, right? Where we're optimizing an input to a neural network with an objective function that's a function of the activations of that network, right? So if you look at the diagram, you have an input image that's fed to the network. It produces some activations. The activations become part of a loss function, which is then back propagated through the network into the input image. Let me show you one example of what you can do with it. You can maximize the activation of a single neuron. And here I compare them to data set examples that also strongly activate the same neuron. Now, those are both valid approaches and can, can give you different insights and can be used in, in a variety of scenarios. But the optimization approach can sometimes be helpful in situations where data set examples are not available. Now, our team, we're not the first ones to think of that. I would say that in the modern deep learning eras, there are broadly speaking two papers that ought to be mentioned as like one of the first ones to, to, to think of this idea. Um, that is Mahendra and Vidaldi in 2014 over at VGG. They fed images into networks and then tried to restore those images from the activations of the network, right? Very similar approach. Um, and then about a year later, Jason Yasinski and co-authors here uh, really inspected the representations at various depths of a network using these types of optimization techniques. But what really got the team excited that I would later join was Deep Dream. I'm not sure if you remembered Deep Dream hitting the internet, but people really enjoyed it, I believe. Um, there, there seemed to be these fantastic worlds of representations inside our neural nets, and we just got to see them. We created the funniest dog slug pictures. And I believe there were lots of like artistic approaches of, of using Deep Dream. But what excited us about it is that it allowed us a look into the representations of a network. It just wasn't very steerable, right? We couldn't really tell it where to look. But from that point on, we were sort of hooked and tried to get it to work for more precise questions too, right? If you read this diagram from right to left, you'll see Deep Dream, which was just maximizing the square of the activations of all the channels in an entire layer. And we managed slowly to make it more precise to be able to look for an individual channel, right? So that's a neuron in all spatial positions or even an individual neuron, right? At a single spatial position. But that's just the background. Let me try to convince you that this technique is actually helpful in understanding what neural nets do by showing you some of the things that we've been able to do with it. The simplest 
idea that you can have, I would, I would argue, is optimizing for the activation of a single neuron in one of these networks, right? That's what you see here. You start from random noise. You take the activations of this orange highlighted neuron in one of the branches of the 4B module of the Inception Reborn architecture, and you stochastic gradient descent your way to the image you see in the upper right-hand corner. Now, on its own, that might look more like an ideal curiosity, but you can combine it with, for example, an actual input image and look at the activations of the network at every spatial position of that input image and explain what those numbers mean by using these little little icons, these little icons for each neuron, right? So if you look at the animation in the bottom, you see sort of a dog ear with a strong activation here. And then you get maybe more of a fox snout, animal snouts behavior, right? And those represent individual neurons. Let's wait until we see the foreground a little bit, right? So there's this green perspective grass. But of course, you don't need to just optimize for a single neuron's behavior. The simplest next step is maybe to optimize to, for linear combinations of neurons, right? Here, in fact, you see like two neurons at a time. And you can see that they combine in semantically reasonable seeming ways. So look at this furriness and art, for example, or this squareness and art, or maybe the black and white neuron that turns the art on the right black and white. And in fact, you can optimize for whole linear combinations, right? So rather than representing each of these activations as a combination of these individual neurons, you can optimize for the entire activation vector at once. These activation vectors can be taken from real images. Right? So you take an image, put it in the network. For a given spatial position, you can extract an activation vector, can turn it back into a feature visualization. And if you do that for all the spatial positions of the image at once, you can get an interesting overview. So if you look at these visualizations from left to right, those are lower layers going to deeper layers. You see that the network represents edges and curves in the lower layers and then transitions to these snout parts and maybe a little bit of fur textures where towards the right, which is maybe like two thirds through the network, you have these fully formed snout parts and cat heads and maybe dog legs. Now, let me attempt to categorize a little bit what I've been showing you. Right? When we think of the activation space of a neural network as a vector space, then these individual neurons and their visualizations that I've been showing you would correspond to a basis direction of that vector space. The pairwise interaction diagram I showed you would correspond to planes of those neurons in activation space. And the special activation grids that I just showed you would be a set of points in activation space, specifically ones that lie on the sub-manifold of likely activations, right? Coming from the natural data distribution, the distribution that the network was also trained on. Now, if you want to understand that entire manifold and not just some points from it, we use a technique we call activation atlas. Let me attempt to explain. To create an activation atlas, we run a data set through a network and sample activation vectors from random spatial positions on those images. Right? So you end up with a million of these activation vectors. We then run those through a dimensionality reduction algorithm and project them down into a two-dimensional plane. Right? Remember that the activation space might be hundreds of dimensions. So it's nice to get them laid out in a 2D plane here. We then make a histogram over it. Right? Where it's a 2D histogram. So it's like a grid within which we then average all of these activations. And that average activation, we then run through feature visualization. So for each grid cell, we create one single feature visualization. When we put them together, we end up with an overview of the representations of the network that we call an activation atlas. Here's one in all its glory. And you can do that at different scales, right? You can zoom into those and use a finer gridding. So let me zoom into that top right corner there a little bit. So here's some human heads and Maybe in the center, there's more like fingers and arms. Let's examine some, some points in the activation atlas. Uh, here are dog snouts, right? You can see them sort of smoothly go from or various orientations and various fur colors. In a very different corner, uh, there's this gas pump scoreboard riding, maybe a little bit of um, 
watermarks in there in the very right. Other areas will have fruit of various texture and color. And you can even find these nice little interpolations through the activation space that go from like fruits in the distance to fruits close up and like many people in the distance to a single person close up. And if you do one of these for each layer, you can even see how the representations evolve through the layers, right? Going from green grass and some high frequency textures through those actual leaf-like shapes to fully formed zucchinis and cabbages and green bell peppers and that stuff. Now, of course, you can subset an activation atlas to only those activations um, found on images with a certain label. Okay, so you have a snorkeler activation atlas on the left here and a scuba diver activation atlas on the right. And one thing to maybe note is that the snorkeler in the bottom left corner has these transparent snorkels, while the scuba diver in the top right has these like black respirators, I mean, tools that actual divers use. Another thing you can do is that you're not bound to project the activations down to 2D, you can project them down to 1D and then use the dimension that you freed up to lay out any other attribute. In this particular case, attribution to, the, to either snorkeler or scuba diver. And the two features that I just talked about in the bottom row here, you can really see there's these transparent snorkels that have high attribution to snorkeler and these non-transparent black respirators that have high attribution to scuba diver. There's also a highlighted cell on the right hand side, something that looks a little bit round and metallic. It's probably one of those tanks that like scuba divers wear on their back. But to us, it looked a little bit like a locomotive, you know, like a steam locomotive, one of these old timey black ones. And so we tried to see how good our understanding was and see whether we could adversarially flip a classification. And it turns out we can. So you take an image of a snorkeler, you know, classified with only 55% confidence. But hey, you add a tiny little locomotive and we're able to flip it to scuba diver with, an high, with a higher confidence than the original image. Okay, that was an overview of some of the applications that we've used feature visualization for. If you're interested in reading more, we have all these papers out on distill.pub, a journal that allows us to publish these interactive articles where you can actually play with the techniques yourself. But now let me try to focus on how we plan to implement feature visualization in PyTorch in a way that feels natural to PyTorch users. So if you remember the core setup, we're optimizing an image based on an objective that is a function of the activations of a neural network. That means we'll need to extract activations from a neural network, for which we'll be using hooks, by the way, and we'll be optimizing an input image so we'll need something that has a parameter that will output an image and allows us to backprop into it. Now I'm gonna try to translate this diagram into code and the API that I'll be showing you, right, is not finalized or anything like that, but it's trying to give you an idea. So as your model, you'll, you'll load a normal pre-trained model in, in PyTorch. And for your objective function, the way we'll set it up is we'll have an objectives module in which there's a simple function, it's called neuron activation, right? So it'll maximize the activation of a single neuron and you point it at a specific module of your network, right? So when I type net.mix3a.3x3, that's a three by three branch in one of the inception modules and I'm pointing it at channel 17. Then we have this input optimization objectives that takes the net and the loss function and can run the optimization for a number of steps. And the call to optimize here really just hides like a normal optimization loop, you know, optimizer.zero grad and things like that. And in the end, you wanna get a result out of it, right? So there's gotta be this parameterization that we're actually optimizing that'll output an image, which we can then look at. So if you put these parts together, that's, that's actual working code um, at the moment. It's in a preview stage and we'll make sure to adhere to the Captain API better. But unfortunately, it's also a little bit of a simplification. Um, if you do that, you get the result on the top. Uh, naive gradient descent gives you a somewhat high frequency dominated image for reasons that we're partly exploring in the papers that I showed you earlier. But the high level takeaway is that we can improve the conditioning of that optimization ob objective by adding a preconditioner. 
which we would call an image parameterization here. And I'll go into detail about that in the next slides. As well as something we call robustness transforms, a stochastic transformation that we put the image through before we feed it into the network and compute the gradients. So here's how that'll look like in PyTorch. We'll have a module whose parameters are just the coefficients of some Fourier parameters, and it outputs an image, right? But in a differentiable way, so that if we get gradients with respect to the image, the parameterization knows how to apply those gradients to its parameters internally. And the other step that we'll add are those robustness transforms. And let me explain what I mean by those. What we do here is we jitter, rotate, or scale an image before we put it into the network. And it helps us avoid these high frequency artifacts. Conceptually, what it means, at least that's the intuition that I use in my head, is to say that, look, I want the input that we're optimizing for here to robustly activate or to robustly maximize my objective function, even if it's moved around a little bit, even if it's rotated a little bit, even if it's a little bit smaller or, or bigger, right? And the reason these seem like good invariance to ask for is that those transformations don't change the semantic content of an image, right? A dog stays a dog, whether it's one pixel further to the left or further to the right. And I was really glad that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel here. We're using transformations straight from the wonderful library called Cornea. So here's how we're going to translate this into code. Um, your robustness transforms are just a normal NN module. They take an image, they output a slightly transformed image. You can even put them in an NN sequential if you've got multiples of those. And our parameterization is also just going to be an NN module. It'll have parameters that are wrapped in NN parameters. And those are the, in our case, Fourier coefficients that'll actually get optimized. And when you call it on its forward pass, it outputs an image. These two you then put into the optimization loop that we already looked at. So let's put it all together on one slide. You set up a pre-trained net. You set up a loss function, in this case, neuron activation. You point it at one of the modules of your net with a channel offset. You set up a robustness transformation that you want your optimization result to be invariant to. In this case, we're wrapping it in an NN sequential because we maybe want multiple of those. We specify an input parameterization. Here, I'm just saying natural image behind the scenes that uses a Fourier transform and a color decorrelation. I then put them in this optimization loop, which I run for a couple hundred steps. And I get out my optimized input image just by calling the input parameterization. And here's how all of that looks together in a diagram. Now, that code isn't quite ready. It'll be on a branch, and the Captain engineers will look at it and probably improve it a lot. But I promise that despite looking a little bit like pseudocode, all the code you saw is actually already running today. Wrapping up. I've been talking a lot about feature visualization and its implementation, but I wanna, I wanna point out that the result of that code are these visualizations, these little glimpses inside the working of those complicated neural nets. And we can put those glimpses together. We can assemble larger explanations and stories about how they work. And I can't wait to see the insights that you'll produce by using these techniques on your own models, by thinking about better techniques, more insightful ideas, built on those primitives or fully on their own. I hope you'll try it out. You can read all about Captum at captum.ai. We're on GitHub. GitHub.com slash PyTorch slash Captum is where you can contribute to the library, read the code, report issues, give us your ideas. And you can also participate in online discussion forums. That's at discuss.pytorch.org slash C slash Captum. I'd like to thank the Captum team for making a production quality library out of what just a couple of years ago was, was still cutting edge research. And even today, I don't think the story is over. And also say thank you to the PyTorch core team. They have been very responsive to our requests about small changes to the API that might make interpretability research easier for us all in the future. Lastly, thank you. Thank you for your attention, for listening to this talk. And I hope you have a lovely rest of this virtual GTC event.